teach at uh, Fuku Gadaichi, and I was hired two years ago uh, in the IB program there. So uh, I'm just going to screen share this here. If you have any like questions just about myself, I'm from Toronto originally. Uh, I've been in Japan about 17 years. Um, I like, like to kind of keep this uh, sort of casual as possible. So if you guys have any questions at any point, feel free to, to speak. Um, this isn't like a lecture, it's just more of a, yeah, it's kind of a story, but it's also just kind of a, you know, a conversation between all of us. So very informal, that's the way I like it. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about the IB film class and uh, some just kind of like general strategies that I've come up with because it's a bit of a challenge uh, teaching this class in a in a Japanese school context. Um, and I'm gonna kind of run through what the IB program is. Um, so I'll just show you this, today's topics. Uh, I'm gonna show you like what the uh, IB program is and those kind of like educational goals. Um, and then in, in particular, why that's challenging within uh, a Japanese high school with kids that have kind of been conditioned in a kind of, you know, in a in an educational system that has sort of opposite goals to um, to what the IB mission statement sets out. Uh, so yeah, so today's topic. So what is the IB program, the diploma program? Um, and then I'm going to introduce my particular course, which is IB Film. And then we'll talk about specific challenges of teaching that class in a Japanese high school. And then, uh, you know, just through trial and error, these are some of the strategies that I've come up with. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys about, you know, looking at this as like a case study, how or how would you teach this or, you know, just from your own, you know, teaching backgrounds, um, like what kind of challenges that you guys have you guys have faced and uh, yeah, it's that kind of thing. All right, so I'm gonna start with uh, the IB. Uh, are you guys familiar with the IB? Yeah, okay. Um, just one sec here. So, all right, so like, I'm not gonna like sit here and read all these like slides. So you just kind of take your time reading through this yourself. Um, you know, with the IB as like teachers, there's like a number of questions that we're kind of constantly asking ourselves, um, you know, grand goals that the IB sets out for us. Um, and a few of these are like, you know, how do we instill in our students knowledge that will make them better learners and better people, right? Like these are big, big goals. Um, another one is like, how do we, after like the two years of the course, how do we send them off into life with the skills they need uh, to grow and develop in a successful, happy way, right? So it's not just like, like this is not just an English language question. This is like kind of deep educational philosophy. Um, and, you know, the, the answer that they come up with is just, you know, standing on a really rigorous uh, educational pedagogy of instilling critical thinking and problem solving skills, um, you know, encouraging diversity, encouraging international mindedness, uh, curiosity, and, you know, hopefully by the time that they graduate, they'll kind of be self directed learners. You know, at the end of the day, we're kind of teaching them how to teach themselves. Um, you know, if you look down here in the bottom right corner, this is like the, the IB learner profile. Ideally, that's what's going to be the kind of the qualities of character that the students are going to walk away with after the two years of the course. All right, so here's a bunch of facts. Uh, and these statistics are, it's a little bit old, actually. It's, I think, 2013. Um, as it stands right now, you know, between like the, the primary years, the middle years and the high school years, there's uh, around the world, there's 1.4 million students in IB 
uh, classrooms at the moment. Um, 5,300 schools around the world um, in, a, in 158 different countries. Now this program started 52 years ago. Check my notes here. Yeah, 52 years ago. And the reason why it started was um, there was a need at that time for like a standardized high school curriculum, um, primarily for like diplomats and like diplomatic, like the children of diplomats. You know, if you were in a school in Sydney or in London or in Toronto or uh, really just anywhere in the world, you know, and you're sent off to, you know, Chad or Egypt or the Philippines, the idea behind the IAB was that it's just going to be like this global high school curriculum and the students that were kind of moved around in this like jet setting lifestyle, um, they wouldn't be suddenly thrust into this other educational platform um, where they'd be left behind uh, their peers. And, you know, it, it's a really rigorous uh, kind of elite educational program, um, you know, with the, the idea in mind that the students will be able to, uh, wherever they live in the world, that they still have the same opportunities to get into an Ivy League school or really just any university that they want to get into. Um, as far as Japan goes, it started in 1979 here. Um, there's 89 IB world schools and 56 high school diploma programs. Um, and, you know, the IB, the, the three languages that they use around the world, it's taught in English, French, and Spanish. Uh, but in Japan, they do actually have a Japanese version of the IB. And so I teach at like my high school. It is a Japanese IB program, um, but the class that I teach is, uh, it's all just taught in, in English. Um, and they do take, you'll see this in a second, um, they take English as a second language. Um, and then I guess, I forget what it's, Bill said that earlier. Uh, you know, like my class, it's not a language class. Like the goals of it are not a language class, but they have to use English in order to, um, to complete all of those tasks. Uh, and then just another little, you know, piece of trivia. So just, you know, graduates from the IB diploma program, just a couple of famous names for you, Justin Trudeau, uh, one of the founders of Facebook, Dustin Moskowitz, uh, the all time winningest contestant on Jeopardy, Ken Jennings, uh, and Academy Award winners, Carrie Mulligan and Lupita Nyong'o. Uh, from 12 Years a Slave. Uh, perhaps the most ignoble graduate, Kim Jong-un, who studied it in Switzerland. Uh, yeah, maybe we're underestimating North Korea's policies. Um, okay, so here's like the basic breakdown of the curriculum. Um, diploma program students have to pass a class from each one of these categories on the right. So these are the six groups. Um, and within these categories, like these are just, you know, departments. Um, there's like a, an enormous number of different classes that they could take um, depending on the size of the IB school. Ours is quite small. We have like a, between five and 10 students per grade. So in my class, for example, in the arts, in film, we have a theater class and a film class and students choose between those. Uh, and the left side there, the core, I'm gonna talk about this in a sec. Um, there's three courses in this. And so one of them is called theory of knowledge, which is kind of like an epistemology type of class where it's really just questioning what do we know about knowledge? Can we trust our own senses? What is a reliable source? And so like that kind of is the sort of glue that holds all of these sort of disparate pieces of, uh, you know, of education between like mathematics and film, like what's the connection between these, um, you know, philosophy or psychology and film. Like, so for me in my film class, I, you know, I have to teach this stuff. So, you know, colors, for example, 
what is an actual, what is the color of red? Is it red? Are there actually colors in the world? Or is it just, you know, our optic nerves creating that color? And so what is the actual source of, you know, color and light and all of that stuff? Um, another one is the extended essay, which is a 4,000 word independent research. Right now, I'm managing uh, and supervising a student who's doing a 4,000 word uh, research paper on Tim Burton uh, and Edward Scissorhands. You know, the question being, what are his influences? Um, and I think his topic question is, uh, in what ways did 1950s popular culture influence Tim Burton's aesthetic style? Um, so like a 4,000 word paper, like I didn't write one of those until I was, I think in fourth year university and he's 17. Right. Um, and then the final one down here, the Cass project, it gets confusing because my name's Cass. And so in the staff room, they're always saying Cass and I'm like, what? And they're like, no, I'm talking about the other Cass, which is the Cass project, which is really like kind of volunteer work or it's really just anything that they want to do. It's just kind of like a journey of self-discovery. So if you wanted to like, so you said, I want to learn the ukulele. Uh, that's your, that's your two year journey is to learn the ukulele. Um, I'm also managing one of those. We started our own kind of art magazine blog. Um, and the girl who's running that as the editor, you know, she's managing like a staff of like, I think six people and they write and update this magazine blog once a, once a week. Um, so it's really just just about anything, really, if you want to do a podcast. So it's quite a dynamic uh, program, and it's it's pretty tough. Like these are examples of the scoring system. So for each one of those group of six classes, um, oh, and I should say this, I apologize. The grades for the IB program are primarily assessed externally. The teachers do assess like a class, like one of the assessments is assessed internally. Um, and we send our recommended grades to the IB, but we also send their, uh, their project or essay to the IB and then the IB kind of like oversights and looks at our grades and they give us a grade based on whether we were too lenient or too strict or appropriate. Um, but primarily the, the assessments, we just like, when they write exams, we put them into a, a pouch and we send them off to, to Europe, to I think Belgium, um, and they get assessed there and then they send us back our grades two months later. Um, and so this is kind of an example of the grading. And so the maximum score is a 45, which, you know, good luck. It's pretty much impossible uh, between all of those different classes. Um, the average worldwide is a 30 out of 45. Uh, just so you're just kind of get an idea of this, 38 is an automatic entry into Harvard. A pass for the diploma is a 24. Um, and so we're kind of at that, here in Japan, we're kind of at that borderline level where it's, you know, probably half of our students are close, but they don't pass. Um, it's tough, it's very, very tough. And so like in my class, for example, you know, it's film, they're doing it in English, they're graded based on the global standard. You know, they're doing it all in English. There's no bell curve um because they're using a second language so again it's quite quite challenging all right so this is uh this is kind of what the theme of today's um talk is about which is you know if you look at these 10 reasons why the IV diploma program is ideal preparation for university um you know ideally these are all excellent uh, goals. But, you know, here in Japan, because they've been conditioned in different ways, a lot of these things are just kind of unattainable, to be honest. Um, it's really hard to just 
have students that have been conditioned in one way and then it's a challenge to try and like recondition them in, in the first year of high school. The first year of high school is pre-IB and then from grade 11 and 12, that's like the full DP program. Um, and so uh, like, you know, for example, number seven here, like DP students have proven time management skills. Yeah, not really. Like, you know, the, the, the dream, ideal IB situation is that, you know, you give a student a task and like by the virtue of their own curiosity, they're gonna go and, uh, you know, research and just with full enthusiasm, attack that project and then come back to two months later and say, here's my work. And we say, okay, this is good. You know, like we're just coaching them to those standards. Not really like, you know, it started out that way. And then two months later, we're like, okay, so show us what you got. And they're like, oh, yeah, nothing. <laughs> right? So, you know, most of our time really is kind of spent managing their time with them and trying to instill these values. But like, we have to kind of be cracking the whip on them. Like we're really hands-on, I would say, um, here in, in the school that I work at. Um, so yeah, so like, do you guys have any questions so far? Or I'm gonna kind of shift away, I'm gonna transition away from the, the particulars of the IB diploma. I'm gonna introduce my course. Does anybody have any questions? I have one question. Uh, yeah, sure. Can you hear? So the fact that you said most students don't actually pass, does that, is that a problem? Do they need to pass to, to carry on the next year or whatever? Um, okay, so this is kind of like the, the reality of it is after like second year of high school, you know, we'll kind of look at the, the progress that they've made and make an assessment at that point, whether to uh, have them continue in the uh, diploma program. There is a certificate program as well, which is kind of like, you know, just that you take three classes instead of the six. And so we may like bump them down into that certificate. Um, and if they don't pass the actual, if they don't get the diploma, I mean, they still graduate from the high school, so they get the high school diploma. Um, yeah. So it's not like they fail high school if they don't get it. Okay, so uh, if there's no other questions, I'm gonna move in now to the IB film class that I teach. Now, two weeks ago, we had an orientation for um, for the pre-IB students that are now com coming into the diploma program. And so I made this orientation video, which basically uh, basically explains everything. And so I'm gonna play that today. It's not, it's not directed towards JOLT at all, uh, but I think that it will give you basically all the information that you need, perhaps too much information. It's about 12 minutes long. Um, but I added some jazzy music in the background, so it should should be breezy. So I'm going to play that right now, and then we'll kind of reconvene after that. Hello, students and parents. My name's Cass, and I teach film studies at Fukuoka Daiichi High School. This is a very unique course. And today, I'd like to give you a detailed overview of the course contents, the educational goals of the course, the course requirements, and how you can help ensure that the students maximize their potential in IB film. If you have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to ask. First, here's a general overview of the course contents. I know it may be a little tricky to picture what a film or an art class teaches. Perhaps your image of a film class is that it's less serious than more commonly taught subjects such as history, math, or science. 
This is most certainly not the case. The IB film course requires both critical thinking skills and creative thinking skills, as well as advanced writing, reading, and presentation skills. In this course, students will not only learn about the world of global cinema, students will also gain a strategic approach to research and independent study that they will be able to replicate in their other IB courses and in their future academic pursuits. The content of this course is film studies, which is interesting in itself, but the hard skills that students will attain are the ability to read and research, the ability to think critically about a wide variety of problems and the ability to organize complex information into coherent written and visual text. Upon successful completion of this course, students will have little difficulty tackling any liberal arts class at the university level, no matter the discipline. So, what are the three core disciplines in IB Film Studies? Let's take a look at this short overview. This will give you a better understanding. and I'm a film teacher at Fukuoka Daiichi High School. Film, you ask? What's a film class like at a Japanese high school? Well, it's pretty cool, actually. The first thing we study is film history from all over the world. We look at how film technology and film art have evolved in different parts of the world and how these different cultures have used this technology and this art form to express their thoughts on life in their respective cultures. The second thing we study is how meaning is created on film. Editing, cinematography, sound design. These are important jobs, and every one of these technicians make important artistic choices every day. But what do these choices mean? Film is a language, and in this course, we study the language of film and learn to read a film the same way that we learn to read a book. The third thing we study is how to make a film. We hold a camera in our hands. We frame a beautiful shot. We create exquisite sound. We make a delicate cut. We make meaningful artistic choices in service of expressing our artistic visions. This is film at Fukuoka Daiichi High School. Next, let's look at how students are graded. The three assessments. The three assessments in IB film each target one of the core disciplines in the course. These are assessed externally by the IB. My job is to support the students and ensure that they meet the IB's standards. First, the textual analysis assesses a student's ability to read both the cultural context of the film's story and how the film comments on and communicates with this cultural context through the filmmaker's filmmaking choices. This assessment is a 1,750 word 
research and analysis essay. Second, the comparative study is a 10-minute video essay that compares and contrasts two different films from two different cultures or time periods. The students need to develop a topic question that links these two films through a specific film focus. For example, a suitable topic question would be, how are the cinematic techniques of film comedy similar and different in Buster Keaton's Sherlock Jr. and Jackie Chan's Police Story? And third, the film portfolio is a nine minute film reel showcasing the student's creative output and creative growth over the two years of the course. Students create various projects that target specific cinematic techniques and then reflect on their projects in a final nine page report. There are only three assessments in this course and no final exam. But I can say with total honesty, it's a lot of work. A lot of work, but very rewarding. Next, let's take a look at the materials that the students will need to purchase in order to complete this course. First, a major part of film studies is the regular habit of writing a film journal. The content of the film journal can be just about anything. Reflections or thoughts on films you've watched, ideas for stories, questions that pop up when you're not at school and want to ask me, the journal is really important, so I would suggest investing in a thick, well-made journal. You will carry this with you everywhere for the next two years. Next, there are three textbooks in this course, and you are required to purchase and read all three. Students will also need to download editing software on their computers. There are many options available. I recommend DaVinci Resolve, which is a free, professional editing software program. Students also need a camera. The camera on their smartphone can be used for all of the projects in this class. If, however, you would like to purchase a higher-end professional camera and have any questions on what to buy, please contact me and I can give you my best advice. Please note, however, that a professional camera is not necessary. And finally, students need to subscribe to Netflix. Many of the films that we watch in this course are available on Netflix. Home viewing assignments will be given on a regular basis. Next, let's discuss the films that we will study in this course. This is really important. This course is not IB Disney. The films that we study are not idealized fantasies about how the world ought to be. They are deep artistic reflections on how the world is and how various humans and cultures survive within these realities of existence. As a result, some of the themes and content in these films are explicit and mature in nature, but never exploitative. The list of films you see here are reflective 
of the types of films I will require the students to watch in this course. Again, the purpose of watching these films is to prepare the students to deal with the complicated reality of living in the real world. Finally, let's ask a question that few teachers or courses ever ask. How can parents participate in this course and ensure that the students are reaching their full potential? Here are a number of suggestions that you can adapt in your daily lives. The study of film, not merely a course in high school. It is a lifelong journey that a family can enjoy together. It is my hope that a passionate engagement with the world of cinema can enrich you and your family's lives the same way it has enriched mine. I wish you all the best as you begin your journey into the world of film. Let's make the next two years a truly life-changing experience. All right, sorry, lots of information there. Um, but that's basically everything. That, that's basically the, uh, the task that I was handed when I started. Um, so yeah, I like that little film there at the end, Pixar's first, first uh, computer, computer film. Um, so the next little section here, I'm gonna ask Bill to kind of put us into breakout rooms. Um, so, I mean, you guys saw the, the curriculum essentially. Um, and you guys have a lot of experience teaching here in Japan. Um, so, you know, what would be some of the challenges of teaching this type of course to the Japanese students that you have had or um, who have come out of this kind of Japanese public school system? Um, and I'm just gonna give you my four challenges that I've encountered before we break out into that. Um, and then, you know, you can discuss those things or, you know, come up with your own as well, because I'm sure there's lots of things that I haven't even considered. So, uh, you know, it says in that kind of reasons, the, the 10 reasons why IB is great is that it's not all about exam prep, yet that's kind of exactly what this educational context is here in Japan is it's all about exam prep. So how do you how do you use that to your advantage, I guess, is um, the challenge. Uh, this number two and number three are basically related. Little to no experience in art studies or art analysis. It's just not taught or even really taken seriously at all here. Um, and number three, cultural bias against art studies, especially from parents. You know, that's just kind of seen as like playtime. You know, art studies, great. Draw a dandelion with crayons. You know, it's just a, it's a challenge to kind of get them to understand that the class is really like, you know, it's the science of motion pictures. Um, and then this is another big one as well that I've encountered is that art is just kind of seen as an innate talent, right? Like we've all heard that before. Oh, I have no sense. I have no sense for drawing um, as opposed to it being an acquired skill um, or even just like this, 
the idea that you could become a, you know, a skilled appreciator or, you know, critical evaluator of, of art in any, in any, you know, medium. Um, and then another one that I didn't write down here that I will just mention as well is there just doesn't seem to be like a film culture. Like, you know, I think, you know, growing up in Canada, um, you know, people are, people are well read in, you know, cultural artifacts that were made before you were born. Right. And so here in Japan, it's like, have you seen Back to the Future? Uh, I wasn't born at that time. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm disqualified from ever knowing even what that is, or why would I watch that in the first place? Um, so these are just some of the challenges that I've encountered. So maybe I think uh, schedule wise, we're okay. Bill, are you there? Do you want to? Uh, yep. Okay. Um, and then after we kind of come back from the breakout rooms, and I, you know, we have a little discussion about that. I think we'll take like a five minute break before we head into section two. All right, so I'm gonna just, I'm gonna leave it to you guys because I don't want to get involved with the dis discussion. I'm just gonna sit out on the breakout rooms. So Cassie, I wouldn't let, wouldn't let me exclude you from being invited to a breakout room. Do you want me to join? No, it's a room. It would only be you by yourself. Uh, okay. Um, uh, cheers. Yeah, I think it's going okay. I think uh, Rich bailed out before the breakout room. He he's not doing it. Rich was here. Oh. And now he uh, he just left. Oh, okay. He's probably got a date. You bailed. I'm going to type in the chat. Okay, that leaves, uh, yeah, Jay and Tim together. So your classes are always um, in person, right? Uh, uh, no, we do. Uh, I would say it's been like seventy percent online oh. in the past year. But uh, so do the students like really get into your cat? I heard a lot of people with cats say that the students just really like their cats. What do you mean? Like if I'm teaching from home and they see the cats? Yeah. 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 And my cats have become kind of famous. But I don't really, I don't teach from home though. Like the whole third semester, the teachers have to go in. Oh, right. And then, and then teach online from school, which is silly. I wouldn't mind if I lived really close. You know, but my commute's over an hour. I'd, I'd be. Oh, I'd be right. Tired, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's the same for me. It's about 45 minutes. So, I mean, just on my way to school, it takes, you know, I got to take the subway and the train. So I, I'm in contact with like 800 people. Probably. So let me see. I, I put them in the room for 10 minutes. So um, the countdown is down to six minutes, 45 seconds. Oh, okay. How many people are here? um let's see eight. right now uh nine and okay That's good. rich was 10 uh, but he says he might have a date well we're recording this <laughs> <Shit>. <laughs> yeah
Well, send me the file and then I'll just edit this part out. Yeah, I'll edit this part out. I can stop the I can pause. All right, looks like everyone everyone's back. Okay, uh, so I guess like maybe somebody from each one of the groups like just kind of summarize what you guys thought or um, good, bad, the ugly, anything's fine. I don't know who was in which group, so Bill, or, do you know? How many groups were there? Uh, let me see, one group we had Jose, Nicholas and Rochelle. Hmm. Did one person want to summarize what they what they said. Ro Rochelle is the film the, the film expert, so we'll leave oh. it to her. <laughs> I don't know if I'm the film expert at all. <laughs> uh, okay. So we did talk uh, first. We just talked a little bit about our own experience in whether or not we've taught uh, any kind of film studies before, uh, and. The answer is we have little to no experience with doing that, uh, although I'm trying to develop a course for my university. Uh, and then we were talking about some of the challenges uh, and we mostly were talking about the fact that there's very little experience in art studies or analysis. You were talking about that as one of the challenges before. Uh, and uh, Jose was saying towards the end, like it's not only about Western culture and Japanese culture or Western film history and Japanese film history and the themes that are there, but also if students are mostly interested in manga and anime, how do you connect those themes that come out of there with other cultures uh, and other films from around the world? Like how do you transcend that barrier basically? Mm. So. Yeah, that's interesting. I completely agree. Uh, and I was, uh, just saying that I was going to ask you, Cass, like, is this mm. something that's come up where students have wanted to talk about anime, let's say, more than other films? Or are they actually interested in more in the films that you're presenting and trying to engage with those? Um, yeah, like some of them do have that kind of anime interest in that background. And, you know, for me, that's not, you know, that's not an obstacle at all. That's like, it's a visual medium, right? And even in like a manga itself is really just a, you know, it's a storyboard that could become a film. So there's ways to incorporate that. Um, but like even like some of the students that I've had, um, they're really, they really excel at other subjects, but like they, they don't even, like some of them are just like from day one, they're like, I don't know, I don't really like movies. Right, so it's like, okay, so let's, you know, we're starting from ground zero, really, just to, to give them some type of hook into the, into that subject matter. So. Okay, and another room had Dominic, Steve, and Trevor. Okay, I'll socks since no one else will do it. Uh, one of our members, especially someone uh, whose name starts with S, I think feels very frustrated about his university students. And uh, we were commenting, uh, all of us were commenting that uh, the course of study seems more like a university course than a, uh, a high school course. And the big problem uh, that we thought, or well, one of the big problems would be that students aren't used to doing things by themselves. So I, I, I started, I started my, my career as a high school teacher. And uh, after that, I, I, had a, I was full-time at a university and had the ZEMI. And in both cases, we really were expected to take care of the students. Mm. And this idea that you set, uh, you set a task with a time limit, one month, two months, and the students will go out and, and organize themselves, that was like really alien. 
far within our experience. So we imagine that that would be a very big challenge for the students and for the teachers as well. Yeah, well, you really kind of nailed it because that's most of our time is really just spent like on like it's not a, a normal IB teacher role. It's really just kind of parental tasks of like, mm. you know, be at school on time, like hand in your homework when it's due. Yeah. Uh, and it's just like kind of teaching basic, you know, professional responsibilities. Uh, right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. Well, I shared with, with my group, for example, when I, I had a Zemi at one point, I was, I was lining uh, one of my students in the morning for her to get up and come to school. Oh. Because otherwise she wouldn't. And when I told my colleagues that I thought this is ludicrous, I thought maybe I'm going beyond, I'm crossing a barrier here, I'm crossing a boundary. And my colleagues said, oh, Marina Sensei, you're a great teacher. How wonderful. So, <laughs> okay, right. You know? Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to jump in here as a university teacher. So I mostly teach first year university students. So they're basically high school students coming into university. It takes a good, good first semester to train them into any semblance of being a university student. Mm -hmm. But I tell them on the very first day, I am not your mother. Hmm. I am not your high school homeroom teacher. I am none of that. You are soon to be adults. You have to, university is your training to be an adult. Mm -hmm. And I cannot hold your hand to do it. And I tell them straight up, like I am not gonna call you in the morning if you're late. I'm not gonna chase after you if you don't do your homework. Uh, I'm gonna remind you, but you're an adult. If you choose not to hand it in and then you choose to fail, <laughs> but I don't, I give students second chances, all that stuff, but I don't, um, I can't be that person for them. <laughs> e but even though I know that that is probably the system that they came out of, but I don't feel that responsibility um, to do that. Uh, no, so I, don't think that, I don't think that's wrong. And I think that it's, uh, you know, it, just for myself as a, teaching in the high school context, you know, I, I think, that's kind of what high school should be about is like by the time that they leave high school um, or really like first grade, so that's when it should be happening. If first grade of high school is that they should be, you know, kind of learning some of the hard lessons in life. Like you're not gonna, you're not gonna pass your, the choices you make right now um, have consequences. And, um, you know, I think it's kind of, at the high school level where they should be getting be or should be learning those lessons not definitely not at university so if i could interject um hello um yeah i um in the uk i taught a, a b-tech uh, practical filmmaking uh, course which was uh, an fe college at students 16 to 18 and uh yeah it was completely learning skills management and life management really was the core of of the course as perhaps more central and what they left the course with than the film knowledge, but certainly 50% of it. And uh, yeah, I think 16 to 18 year olds, that's fair enough um, that you're, you're guiding them on that path. And perhaps in a university course, yeah, you shouldn't be um, doing quite so much babysitting and it, you sort of need to, to let them sink or swim a bit, but yeah, 16 to 18, we're still guiding our students. And so it's, I think that's important that, you provide that opportunity and let them make mistakes and learn from them and yeah but not just a, not just an eastern thing uh needing to baby students of 17 years old uh although the b-tech filmmaking course was perhaps a little less academic than this hmm. how many uh, students did that make this uh, add quickly to be fair in japan legally the students are children until they're 20 years old and emotionally, they themselves <laughs> feel that they are children. And then when they're 20, they're suddenly adults. And so now they're going to start to be adults. But they're starting, they're starting from zero at, at, at an emotional level. Like yesterday I was a child, now, now I'm an adult, but I don't have any training. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any practice at being an adult. Whereas for me, growing up in Canada, I'm sure we all had something similar. High school is when you are you start you start to stop being a child, 
and start being an adult or a pre-adult, a proto-adult. And so, you know, there's constant stresses and struggles against your parents, against the teachers, and you're slowly taking on more and more responsibility. But that generally doesn't happen in Japan. From my experience, talking with my students. I, I completely agree. Um, you know, if it were up to me, I would, uh, I would almost make it a requirement that the students have some type of a part-time job, at least like once a week, you know, go and go and taste what it feels like to be a, a dishwasher at a restaurant because, you know, that's how I learned how to become an adult, like from 16 years old was I realized, okay, well, I guess I should study hard because I don't want to do this my whole life. Cassie, what, what occurred to me was that you got this oversight happening, right? From that you're sending all their assignments off to 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 another country to be graded, and then and then your school's getting graded. The universities here just want to get the fourth year students out the door and they let them get away with you know all sorts of just I mean with, with nothing. They let them get away with nothing. But it sounds like you know, you we're talking about all this hand holding and things like that, but like there's accountability built into your system that simply isn't built into the universities, I think. Okay, right. Um, well, you know, like which I'm, is I'm, great. I mean, I envy it, man. Jeez, I mean, I'd love to, to I, I would love for, for my threats to the students to have some teeth, you know, so that would actually listen, but they think, oh, never mind, I'll just do a side issue in fourth year and they'll pass me anyway. So never mind. You know, it's sort of it's this toothless tiger thing we we're all in. Well, that also that being said, however, and you know, I'll put myself at risk by saying this, even though I know that we're being recorded, you know, we also have a certain amount of responsibility to make sure that the students do pass because, you know, the results of our school within that program, you know, the fact that we have a certain number of students passing every year, that's also, it's important. Um, but, you know, just as teachers, we're, we're tired. We're tired of, you know, having to kind of do a lot of the heavy lifting for the students. And we're trying to kind of shift a lot of that responsibility onto them because it is their, it's their life. You know, right? can, can I jump in here with another question? Just based on, still on this topic, uh, what, what do you do in your class? Because you were saying like, you just can't give an assignment and say two months later, where is it? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. how do you guide your students through that process? And is it mostly in their first year of the program so that in the second year, you're less hands-on or how do you, yeah. how do, you do it? Right, so uh, I, this will be my third year coming from April. So it's been like a lot of trial and error for me. Like I, I kind of taught this, like I, I created this whole curriculum really just out of nothing and I had to teach myself a lot of this stuff. Um, so I've kind of, I've switched it now so that in first year I'm teaching them the visual arts class so that I can get, oh, like I'm gonna show you guys this in the second half of the presentation, um, the methodology that I use. Um, but I'm teaching them like a lot of the, the visual vocabulary language that they need in the first year of high school. So that way we can actually just sink our teeth into like film history um, and start like applying a lot of that sort of conceptual knowledge into actual practice. Um, and just the enforcement of that is, you know, they have these assessments, which are, you know, massive projects, but I just make, I make it a, just a weekly um, assignment that they have to hand in every Friday. And if they don't hand it in, then, um, I mean, we have a certain amount of freedom to you know, to make threats and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's a, it's a small school within this bigger ecosystem. So we do have a, a fair amount of authority and, you know, talking to their parents and all that kind of stuff. So it's just really, it's just hands-on stuff, right? And so the reason why I brought this up was just because, you know, the 10 reasons to why the IB is great is that they become independent learners well, like from the beginning, they're not. And so you just have to gradually over time. And by third grade, they're not that, they're not that. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I had a, a, a friend teach in the IB program in Switzerland mm. uh, in an elementary school. Mm. And she would talk about how the fact that they're trying to 
teach the students to be independent and to do their own thing. And at the end of class, the chauffeurs would be there to pick up the kids and carry their bags for them. And it was very frustrating because whatever was taught at school went out the window the second they walked out of school at the end of the day. So, yeah, it's a it's a strange rule. Yeah. Um, so, this one, do you want to do the break? Yeah, let's do a five minute break and then we'll come back. And then I'm just going to kind of breeze through the second half of this so that it's. Uh, yeah, I mean, we should be. I could probably do come back half, at yeah. um, 9.15. Sounds good. Seven okay. Minutes. I want to pause the recording. Um, okay, so I'm going to just kind of breeze through this, try and wrap it up in about 30 minutes or so. Um, so the next thing we're going to look at here is like just some of the strategies and really just like two kind of main strategies that I've just again found through trial and error um and kind of keeping in mind what we talked about with some of those challenges like it is an exam prep culture um it does require like a lot of hands-on teacher uh management um and so eh, i think that probably through these through this kind of traditional Japanese type of classroom teaching, the goals of the IB can still be achieved, but it just kind of comes from this like opposite uh, angle. And so that's just kind of what I'm gonna go through right here. Um, so here is how I have approached the IB film class. So reverse engineering the assessments. So like right from the beginning of, of year two, which is like year one of the two year course, um, I, I give the students model assessments that are available on the IB uh, website. Um, I show them like, this is what a seven uh, in IB film looks like. And then we, like, they're all in English. So, I, you know, I, I tell them, like, let's break this down. Let's translate this uh, from English into Japanese so that you do understand all of the content that's being written about or discussed. Um, and let's really just kind of dissect what these things are. Um, so I, I do teach to the assessments. Um, it would be great if I could, you know, if I could, just go through all this kind of self-directed learning and then give them the assignment or the assessment at the beginning of year three or year two of the IB, DP. Um, and then just through all of that kind of skill practice, they'll just kind of look at it and go, oh, okay, I know exactly how to attack this thing. It, that's just, it's just not gonna happen. So, um, so we do kind of, uh, we look at the assessments and then we just, basically figure out how to Im imitate those standards. Um, that being said, this is the comparative essay. And I'm just gonna, this is a, it's a 10 minute video essay. I'm not gonna show you the full 10 minutes. Uh, I'll show you like about a minute or two. Um, this is a, this was a seven. So this is a perfect score. Um, you know, I'm assuming like a Canadian or a, or a American kid did this. Uh, so just to give you an idea, so it's not just the writing or the written text, it's also, um, you know, editing, you get the two films, and then you have to figure out which clips you're going to cut from that and then turn this into a 10 minute video essay. So this will just kind of give you an indication of the task put forth. In this comparative study, I will explore the similarities and differences of the narrative arcs between two coming-of-age films, Lady Bird, a 2017 film directed by Greta Gerwig, and The Graduate, a 1967 film directed by Mike Nichols. The book, Coming of Age on Film, by Anne Hardcastle et al., depicts coming of age as a discovery implicit in any moment of transformation. Indeed, the films The Graduate and Lady Bird both exhibit revelations in their journey to adulthood. 
However, the development of that revelation is what sets these two films apart. To understand that difference, we need to first explore the context of these two films. Both of these films take place in California, but they depict very different socio-economical, geographical, and historical contexts. The Graduate takes place in a wealthy upper middle class family who criticizes the middle class for its superficial and materialistic ideals. Plastics. Made in the midst of the Vietnam War, although never explicitly mentioning war in the film, it captures the political and social change from the growing dissatisfaction with the status quo and mirrors the anarchic mood perfectly. The film challenged the self-imposed censorship of Hollywood through its unconventional storytelling, featuring a hero that lacks purpose but speaks of radical skepticism about American values of ambition, vision, and drive. Would you mind telling me then what those four years of college were for? What was the point of all that hard work? You got me. Lady Bird. Hi. So that's kind of, you know, if, if you want, I can send you uh, the full version of that. Um, so yeah, so that's basically one of the assessments. Um, and so these are the strategies that I've come up with. Uh, the first one is teaching film specific concepts and vocabulary. You know, in the actual assessment guidelines for um, this subject, the students have like, students are graded basically on their ability to use film specific language. Um, and basically being able to identify um, and dissect a given film and to be able to, yeah, like I said, identify um, the film techniques within uh, any given film. And uh, one of those things that we're gonna look at right now is the concept of mise-en-scene. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of run you through this. And like the way that I teach this to the students is I tell them like, look, the way in which we're gonna write about film in this class is if I give you, I don't know, like ET, for example, and you write me a, uh, you know, a 400 page report on ET, and you tell me how, how sad you were when ET left or when ET almost died and like how you felt about it. I don't care. Like, that's not what this is about. Um, I want you to look at like a, a five minute segment of ET and be able to identify all of these elements right here. So, um, so mise-en-scene, uh, you know, this was a term coined by, uh, by a French critic, uh, Andre Bazin in 1948. And it's the uh, expressive totality of what we see in a single film image. Um, some people these days, they argue that even sound itself is part of the mise-en-scene. Um, but traditionally, it's basically everything that we see within the film image is considered mise-en-scene. Um, also, I should say, and I'm, I'm not going to like spend a lot of time teaching this stuff, but just so that you're clear on the concept, film studies takes this uh, assumed approach that you know, it's an art of any, any film or any photograph or any piece of art. Uh, it's a representation of real life. It's not real life itself. You know, it's a manufactured document by, by a human. Um, and because it's representational, it can therefore be analyzed uh, based on the expressivity of the artist's intent and meaning. Um, and so the tools by which we can analyze uh, any given piece of art um, are all of those kind of technical components. And so mise-en-scene is one of those. So we're gonna look at this photograph or this shot here from Citizen Kane. Um, and like, this would be something that I would give to my students like not even to analyze a full film, just analyze this one simple frame from this shot. Um, and then from there, we'll kind of build out into 
an actual scene and then into an actual sequence and into a an act and then to a, an actual film itself. Um, so these are kind of like the technical concepts and questions that I want the students to write about in a mise-en-scene analysis, for example. So <clears throat> you can just kind of look at this here. Um, and, you know, this is just a checklist of stuff. And so like, you know, when I, when I do like in, in class assessments, just on, you know, regular schoolwork, you know, if the students aren't talking about these things, you know, if they, if they do a, you know, a mise-en-scene analysis and they don't talk about color values, for example, um, or they don't talk about the camera angle, you know, that's, a, that's, that's a question with my red and then I'm going to ask them, it's like, what about the color angle or the camera angle? Um, so I want them to be constantly aware of all of these concepts and that that's what they should be writing about and you know, they should be thinking about. And it's not just a, a simple, you know, writing exercise. It's really just teaching the students how to actually see for the first time. So, you know, if they look at this, you know, black and white photograph, most, you know, young people or even older people tend to have an allergic reaction when they see something in black and white. Um, but, you know, if they have the ability to see and to analyze and to identify these elements, um, then it's not just going to seem like this old artifact. They're going to actually be able to identify and appreciate what's actually going on within the frame. So these are just some of the, the concepts here. Um, and then let's just actually take a look at this scene because there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, certainly in this scene, depth of field, that's what Citizen Kane was really known for. Um, there's a lot of activity going on in the foreground, middle ground, and in the background. And they're all kind of commenting on each other. And this is kind of when we get into the interpretive stage of film analysis. Um, this is where we can really have quite a bit to say about what's going on in the scene. So let's just take a look at this. It's about a minute and a half. Papers now, Mr. Thatcher. You people seem to forget that I'm the boy's father. It's going to be done exactly the way I told Mr. Thatcher. There ain't nothing wrong with Colorado. I don't see why we can't raise our own son just because we come into some money. If I want it, I can go to court. A father has a right to. A border that beats his bill and leaves worthless stock behind. That property is just as much my property as anybody's now that it's valuable. And if Fred Graves had any idea all this was going to happen, He'd have made out those certificates in both our names. However, they were made out in Mrs. Kane's name. He owed the money for the board to the board of The bank's decision on all matters can I don't to... hold with signing my boy away to any bank as guy. I want you to stop because... all this nonsense. The bank's him. decision on all matters concerning his education, his places of residence, and similar subjects is to be the final. The idea of a bank being the guardian. I want you to stop all this nonsense, Jim. We will assume full management of the Colorado load, which I repeat, Mrs. Kane, you are the sole owner. Where do I sign, Mr. Thatcher? Right here, Mrs. Kane. Larry, I'm asking you for the last time. Anybody think I hadn't been a good the husband? The sum of fifty thousand dollars a year is to be paid to you and Mr. Kane as long as you both live, and thereafter to the survivor. Well, let's hope it's all for the best. It is. Junior Power! Have my daddy's death! Why I can't raise my own voice? Go on, Mr. Thatcher. <laughs> Everything else, the principal as well as all money's earned, is to be administered by the bank in trust for your son Charles Foster Kane until he reaches his 25th birthday, at which time he is coming to complete for that. Uh, Rosebud. Um, okay, so, you know, other units that I teach, and I, sh I should say, like, you know, the mise en scene unit, I did that one in January and February with uh, my second graders. Um, you know, like if I was teaching this to the native English speakers, you know, I would imagine that it would go much quicker. Like the 15 things there, it took me like two months to, 
to really teach that. So like one of those, one of those elements would be, you know, a 50 minute lesson. It takes, it takes time, but, uh, but the students do get it. So these would be other units within like the kind of formal, the formal analysis of film. So screenwriting, sound, editing, performance, cinematography. Um, and uh, what we're gonna look at next, uh, the kind of methodology about how to assess or analyze, um, you know, film or like anything in the visual arts um, could also be applied for all of these units as well. Um, so, so this is something that I found uh, called the Feldman model. Um, and he was a, or so is a, uh, a visual arts professor at Georgia University. Um, this fellow here, Edmund Burke Feldman. Um, it's a face I would like to have a beer with someday. Um, so he's, yeah, he's still alive. Um, so he came up with this four step uh, approach to uh, art analysis and art criticism. You know, it's art is like, it's such a fuzzy, you know, vaporous thing to, to assess. Um, and this method that he came up with, I really like it because, you know, not just for the students, but I think just for really anybody um, making, you know, a, you know, a qualitative statement about any type of art, uh, I think that this is a useful model to kind of step away from just our own subjectivity and kind of cognitive biases um, or even cultural biases when we assess something. Um, so I think that this approach uh, is quite good. And so we're gonna look at this in terms of visual art for a moment. Uh, so the four step Feldman method. It's a real photograph, by the way, Robert Frank, 1955 in New Orleans. Um, so the first step in this is basically description. We're just talking about like, you know, writing or even just in your, in your head, I guess. But let's just assume that this is a written assignment. The first step is to look at a, a piece of visual art like this photograph here and using like neutral language, just basically describe all of the contents within that photograph, uh, as well as all of the kind of contextual information behind the photograph. So the artist's name, when was it taken, all that kind of research information that would be uh, in this description stage right here. Um, step two would then be analysis. And then this would be where, you know, all of that mise-en-scene information that we just looked at would come in. Um, all of these questions here, these are just you know, visual art analysis questions and concepts. Um, and you know, with this analysis stage here, you know, when we're looking at whether it's a mise-en-scene concept or like an, a choice that the artist made, we can then kind of tie that into and you know, make connections with all of that kind of neutral uh, descriptive information from step one. So then step three is then when we can get into interpretation. And really what we're concerned with here is, um, is the analysis of the meaning of the choices and the express expressivity of the, of the artist. Um, you know, asking questions like, what is the story being told? Why did the uh, photographer of this shot here, you know, decide to put his camera in that position? Um, what is the you know, relationship between all of the disparate parts within the image itself? And then finally, this is, he uses the word judgment, which for me, it seems a little bit uh, I don't know, egotistical to assume that, you know, that I could be in some type of privileged position to judge somebody else's art. Uh, so I prefer a critical evaluation. Um, and th this is now the stage where, you know, the writer, the student, or really just the, the consumer of the artistic product can then give an opinion on what they think of it. 
Um, so as opposed to just giving opinions, um, you know, just by looking at something and going, ew, I hate it. Because we've gone through steps one, two, and three, they're actually informed opinions that could probably be uh, defended in civil discourse. Um, I think that the final question right here, this is like the main thing for me um, in art evaluation, uh, is how successful do you think the artist was in expressing his or her intentions? And because we've gone through like the rigors of formal analysis, um, I think that we could probably answer that question uh, rather definitively. So the next question then is, so this visual arts methodology, how to apply that home studies? Well, if we go back to the original Citizen Kane shot there, I think that we can probably go through the description analysis using all of the, all of the mise-en-scene terminology and concepts that we've learned, um, go through an interpretation stage and then make, an, make a critical evaluation. And really like for the film studies assessments, um, the critical evaluation stage isn't even really necessary. Um, it's more just about here's a, a film object. Can you dissect this and identify all of the parts? That's essentially what we're doing. So, um, so I've used this method. I started using this in my second year of teaching. Um, and uh, just as kind of like a, a final, you know, as a final part of this presentation, um, I just want to show you uh, one of my students' comparative analysis uh, visual essays. Um, and just for context, she got a four. Not, like, not a seven, but she got a four, um, which is a pass. And so all, all of my students passed my class. Um, and so she got a four on that, which again, that's a global four, which is pretty good, I would say. Um, you know, she's going up against, you know, as, as a second language user of English, uh, that's a pretty decent score, I would say. Um, so we'll just do it again, like in about 90 seconds of this. Mise en scène, as defined by the film scholar Ed Seekov, is the totality of expressive content within the image. But how does expressive content differ between different directors? And how can different directors from different cultural backgrounds use mise en scène to express their vision of the world? In this comparative study, I will look at the signature expressive styles of two dysfunctional comedy films. The Royal Tenenbaums, a 2002 American film directed by Wes Anderson, and Good Morning, a 1959 Japanese film directed by Yasujiro Ozu. These two films are both of comedy genre and the stories are focused on the dysfunctional family. But these films have different cultural backgrounds and periods. I will analyze the similarities and differences between these two films and how they use mise-en-scene and other style elements to express their vision in similar and different ways. The Royal Tenenbaums takes place in New York. Hi. So, yeah, so I was really proud of her. She did a pretty good job. Um, so, just my kind of concluding remarks on this. Um, you know, in teaching this kind of class, it's, I can't do it. I can't do it in the IB ideal way. Uh, but I can say that through rigorous training and vocabulary uh, and methodology, the, the Feldman method that I just spoke of. Uh, I have met with some success. I hope to get more success out of the students um, in teaching a Western style art class in a Japanese school context. Um, so that's pretty much it for me. Um, if you guys have any questions uh, or any comments, I mean, we can open this up for discussion again. Uh, may, may I ask a question, Cass? Yeah, absolutely. Um, does this put the students at a disadvantage uh, if they're only getting fours and such um, when they're going for their university entrance? Is um, 
how does that work for them? Um, uh, not really, because like if anybody who's getting sevens, they're going into Harvard, right? And so like these guys, they're just, you know, they're, they're looking at like, you know, most national universities in the country will just, even if they didn't pass the IB, but they went through that, like they still get into pretty good schools. Okay. Yeah. So, so they take it into consideration that they've done a course which is using English as a basis for assessment as a second language. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Uh, for those of us wanting to do something similar with our students, mm. uh, are there any resources that you recommend or places to start or not start based on your own experience with developing this course? Um, well, the three textbooks that I use, I chose those myself just because they're, they're relatively beginner level um, for film studies. Um, and I can give you the names of those. Um, and then also I would really recommend just as a general methodology, is kind of use that four-step method of, uh, of Feldman. And once they kind of get that into their head and like, you really kind of have to be rigorous in, in, in using that as both a basement, uh, as a basis for assessment and also just like weekly, just you got to hammer that into them. Right. Um, and so if you, uh, do you guys have like a, like an ebook resource in Jelt? You guys have like a library or something like that? Because I have these books all electronically so I could send them to you. So he has like a really fantastic book um, called, I forget what it's called, but it has like his whole outline of, this is like the, the an educational basis for critical evaluation of visual arts. Um, it's, it's worth a read. You could tell us the titles so we could um, hang on a add those to the website. Okay, I'm gonna just step out of this for a sec here. Uh, just hang on a sec. Is there, do you guys have any other questions? I'll just kind of plug away at this. Bill, how do you want to do this? Do you want to just wrap things up or do you, is there any, do you guys want to have a discussion about this or? Uh, <clears throat> well, are there any more questions? Does that, does anyone have any more questions? If I'd, not, uh, oh, go I'd ahead. One, yeah. one question about, um, do you, have you ever come across like taboo subjects? Of course, you're introducing, but uh, if you selected the movies you introduced, I was looking at the list and uh, that you like Truman Show and that, and it didn't seem to be you no know, like sex scenes or anything, but there's Godfather, which is violent, I think. But is that the original Godfather? But uh, yeah, um, so <clears throat> this is an IB recommended thing is um, we do get the parents to sign a waiver. So I just wondered if you're introducing concepts like the, the mission statement, I just reading again, like it's become caring and knowledgeable and compassionate. And it's like what everyone, what we, what we want to do, you know, we want to make everyone like that. But, um, but if you introduce any, any concepts that are odds with like parents, I'm not saying that mm -hmm. some, uh, you know, there might be, was it parsnips? You shouldn't mention all the politics and, alcohol religion sex and uh yeah stuff. but do you have any have you had any problems with that any, I haven't had any problems with problems? it um and you know i've i've shown some like pretty crazy stuff 
like we watched old boy in, in class um i got a little awkward when he discovers it's his daughter um but uh yeah, I mean, because the parents sign off on this stuff and, you know, within that waiver itself, I give them a list of the films that we're going to watch and they can look at the, them up themselves. And I say in there that, you know, if, if you would prefer that your child not watch these films, that's completely fine. There's, I can give them an alternative title um, that would hit the same, you know, edu educational points that I'm trying to make. Um, but, you know, like even within like the content of the films themselves, like it's not just this class, but like we do tackle dark themes in the school. Like we're not a, we don't have like a religious mandate about stuff. We do look at the world in a realistic way. Like we look at genocide, we look at um, you know, like the horrors of humanity and the, the total bloodbath that it's been. But we look at it from a perspective of critical evaluation. Um, so, yeah. So I haven't really had any problems with that. It's all it's all taught in context. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a good question. I know one one other question. Are your students particularly high proficient in English, or just seems really difficult, like four thousand word essay and, mm. and understanding all the English? Do you just have to just keep drilling the vocab and mm. they're just normal normal students, yeah um well we get some who are better than others we get uh like in one class for example we'll have uh like a few of the returnee kids from the u.s or canada mm -hmm. Australia. Yeah. Um, we'll get a few uh international students from like china or korea um like it, we, it's an international it's a kokosaika program so we do oh, have okay. international school kids um who or like for example you know, we, we've got a few students from China who moved here at the beginning of junior high school. So they do have a certain level of proficiency in Japanese, but they also have a certain level of proficiency in English. But that being said, the majority of the students that we do get, we kind of, we require them to have at least Jun EQ um, in Aiken um, or like second grade Aiken. Otherwise, it's just going to be too. This has been too tough. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So, can you tell us a little more about who your students are? So, you know, what, what is their motivation for taking this? And you know, they obviously their parents have a big say in this. So, why do their parents want them in this instead of going to a Japanese uh, high school and university? Mm. Um. Well, I'll be honest. Like. You know, a lot of the students that come to the school, because it's been like an, an international department for like almost 30 years, a lot of the students come to the department because they like English and they have kind of this dream that they're going to go overseas someday. And so like we try to really uh, service those students by like we want to send a lot of our students to overseas universities, not to Japanese universities. Um, and so I think that's probably the main reason why. But that being said, you know, the reality is that there's a difference between, you know, liking English because you like Justin Bieber or Western pop music to then getting into like the deep end of what the IB is about. Um, and so that's another challenge, I would say, is that they just don't really they don't really know what they're getting themselves into until it's too late. And that being said, so in Kyushu, um, there's only three IB schools. There's our school, Linden Hall, which is also part of the same group. And then there's one in Okinawa. I just have a question about, uh, about the um, recruiting. Do you have any problem recruiting recruiting students? Do you have more students applying than you have places? Uh, yeah, recruiting is an issue. I, would say. Mm -hmm. um, I think that like you know our our rival is not like other international schools because it's mm -hmm. primarily taught in Japanese. It's a Western education taught in Japanese, mm -hmm. with, like my class. So like our 
and it's really high level, right? So our competition is like the high level school. The the uh, the rivals are the the other high level schools like Shuyukan and you know Jonan, all mm -hmm. of these, all of these schools that um, that's who we're in competition with is mm -hmm. trying to. It's a tough job. It's like trying to create a market within this Woka ecosphere where the yeah. students just look at Shuyukan, they look at Jonan. The brand name is there. They know that if they get in there, they're going to be able to go to this university within Japan. So that's kind of the issue with it. It's just being able to create a market where there hasn't been one before. So that's kind of the issue. Yeah. And it's just a matter of like sticking with it until you we build out that reputation and get some graduates into good schools. Right. What's the size of uh, the international element of your high school? What's the cohort? Uh, so between the three grades, it's about 45 to 50 students. Um, but we also have like a kind of an ongoing, um, number of international students that come over during non coronavirus times. So we'll have like a, at least like five to 10, um, exchange students that'll come over from Australia, Canada. And what's the size of the rest of the high school? Presuming there is a separate section. Oh yeah. So it's probably about 1800 kids. Right. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Okay. At this time, if there are no more questions, could I ask everyone to please open up your camera and mic to give our uh, presenter a round of applause. Yay. Yeah, thank you guys so much. It's been a lot of fun.